Thank you for joining us. Welcome from me, Michael Scott. I'm in the Lake District in the UK, Wordsworth's country, where the daffodils are out, but the rain is pouring down. And welcome also from my joint convener, uh, Sandy uh, Sanford J. Ungar in Washington, DC, to this, uh, the 42nd jointly promoted event between the Future of the Humanities Project and the Free Speech Project. The latter is sponsored by Georgetown University and the former by Georgetown's Humanities Initiative in association with Campion Hall, Oxford and the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Together, the two projects consider issues concerning human dignity, rights, cultures, histories, traditions and freedoms in a wide spectrum of educational activity, policy, expression and aspiration. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sandy, who is the director of the Free Speech Project. He will introduce today's distinguished guests and moderate the ensuing discussion before I return to chair the question and answer session. From the start, you can type in questions to the panel by using your Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Use please the Q&A button, do not use the chat button. These questions will come to me during the session and I will try and put as many of them as I can to the panel for consideration later on. We urge you to ask questions as and when they occur to you so that we don't have a bottleneck at the end. I'm looking forward to this, uh, to this uh, discussion greatly today. Over to you, Sandy. Thanks very much, Mike, and uh, welcome to everyone who's uh, been kind enough to tune in to us. I want to introduce our panelists right at the start, Deborah Tannen is a distinguished university professor at Georgetown University here in Washington, DC, and uh, a pioneer in the field of linguistics and helping a broad audience understand some of the issues that stake in linguistics broadly defined. Ian Finley is a fellow of Harris Manchester College at Oxford and a man of broad exposure and, and uh, interest in these ideas. We look forward to hearing from him. John Dracakis is professor of English at Stirling University in Scotland, uh, writes frequently on these issues and uh, also someone we're eager to hear from. Jessica Mudry from Toronto Metropolitan University in Canada uh, is a student of rhetoric and teacher of rhetoric, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, came out of other, other fields to discover this as a very important part of endeavor. So we look forward to this rich variety of perspectives and uh, taking the subject forward. Sorry, just to correct, I'm not a student of rhetoric, I'm a professor of rhetoric. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a while since I've been a student, but I guess whatever I'm doing for my skin is working, so. <laughs> I think Sandy's picture may have frozen. Hmm. Can you hear me, Deborah? Yes. Hi. Hi. I think uh, we've got we a problem him. with Sandy's, uh, Sandy's picture. Uh, I think he wanted to ask you, um, uh, about uh, the politics and English language. George Orwell wrote that political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind. <laughs> what, do you to, what do you make of that? To start um, us all off. Yeah. Um, my feeling is that that's probably true from one perspective, but true of all uses of language. Um, you could apply that that perspective to uh, conversations you've had where you think the other person is distorting things. Um, I guess in many ways, I often think that political language and public language is just an extension um, and, and expansion of the kind of thing that goes on in everyday life. 
Um, I actually wrote a book way back in 1998 about, it's called The Argument Culture, um, about how our public discourse has become more adversarial. Um, everything is framed as a fight. Um, every issue has two sides. And so you want to get the most extreme representation of each side so they can fight. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth that that still is very true today. Um, a difference that is very intriguing to me, the word lie has become far more prominent than I've heard of before. Everything is a lie and everyone's accusing other people of lying. And you remember that key moment when um, on the floor of the House of Representatives, I think it was, someone yelled, you lie to um, a colleague. Uh, and it's interesting because so much of what we hear as not true, we wouldn't actually say is a lie. A lie means you're intentionally saying something that's not true for some for some end. Um, but I think the issue of what can you believe and what is true and what is not true, that's been a challenge that people have been facing forever. Um, you know, there are languages, and sometimes I wish our language was this way, there are languages where grammatical bits are either required or frequently used that tell you how you know the source of what you're saying. We call them evidentials. Uh, native language, American languages, many of those uh, languages have, have this and use it a lot. So that if I say something, I need to add a little bit, a little linguistic bit that says, I know that because it happened to me or I know that because I heard it, um, which I think that would clarify things uh, somewhat if our language required that. But the fact that languages have that to me um, is indication that there has always been this challenge of what do we believe and what do we not believe and what is being said just for an end. You know, think the whole concept of gossip. Um, is it true? Is it not true? Is it just being said to destroy someone? And there's many examples of that where people will um, fabricate gossip to hurt someone that they're uh, opposing. But um, yeah, I think everything being framed as fights between people, yeah, it's been a long time coming, but um, has, perhaps, has perhaps gotten worse in, uh, in recent years. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's lots more to say about that, but I think... I don't think it's something particular about political language. I think it's an issue in everyday language that is perhaps um, has greater consequences when it's political language. Thank you, Deborah. And I have to apologize for having lost my connection briefly there for a minute or two. Um, John Dracakis, um, do you suppose that this is a unique moment in history, that there is a crisis of truth, a crisis of of speech, of rhetoric, of, of of meaning in in politics, or is it really business as usual and we're just a little bit hysterical about it right now? Well, there are about three things there, really. Um, le leave the hysteria part of it uh, aside for the moment, because I think the hysteria itself is dependent upon uh, the circumstances. Um, but uh, no, I, I think that we have different ways of disseminating language now. Um, I mean, uh, I, I'm looking down at some quotes that I've uh, taken out of uh, Orwell's essay on political language. And, you know, he just says, political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question begging, and sheer cloudy vagueness. Now, these are characteristics of language but they have a special bearing, I think, on political language. Um, he then says that the great enemy of clear language, because he has a particular idea of, of clear language, is insincerity. Um, and he then goes on to say that politics itself is a mass of lies, evasions, folly, hatred, and schizophrenia. <laughs> now, you can say that all of those characteristics are there in language, or have the potential to be there in language. But uh, what Orwell is doing is arguing from a particular attitude to language that he supports, 
and then looking at politics as um, various ways of um, producing aberrations uh, of, of that language. Um, the big difference, I think, bear, bear in mind that Orwell wrote this in, what, 1946. Um, there were no uh, mobile phones. Um, there was no internet. There were no computers, or at least not in the hands of everybody. So um, we have different ways of disseminating language now. And therefore, of course, uh, with particularly in relation to politicians, they take account of that, right? I don't know whether a politician is lying to me or not, because I don't have the evidence to um, uh, to make that decision. You know, I can listen to one, I can listen to the other, and I can just go with my gut, really, unless I have uh, graphs, um, you know, uh, and, and things like that in front of me that gives me an analysis of the situation. Um, and I mean, this happens, this happens frequently, but I mean, we can't tell any longer whether somebody is lying or telling the truth. Um, I mean, there was a time 400 years ago when somebody like Ben Johnson could say, um, you know, uh, what's it, let me get, get the quotation right. Um, yes. Um, there is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. That's it, Shakespeare. Ben Jonson says uh, that uh, language most shows a man speak that I may see thee. Um, and there were all kinds of rhetorical devices that enabled you um, to communicate the reality of who you are, what you are. Now, of course, as far as politics is concerned, People disguise who they are, and they usually produce various forms of words. I mean, um, I've got here uh, yesterday's newspaper. I haven't got today's newspaper, um, but there's a huge fuss at the moment in Parliament uh, because uh, somebody who really stays beneath the radar, usually, um, but who has donated £10 million to the Tory party, has actually said of um, a black woman MP that, uh, you know, she should be shot. Um, and who says, and has said this publicly, apparently, um, he says uh, that uh, whenever he sees this this MP, her name is, is Diane Abbott, who's, um, you know, a really groundbreaking MP in many ways, uh, says uh, that it makes you want to hate all black women. Okay. Now, you know, anybody would find that offensive. Um, apparently, the Tory party was very, very slow to acknowledge this. And now, of course, he has apologised. And he has, quote, shown remorse. Now, I don't see any remorse. Um, and I think the idea of an apology here is something that we need to think about as well as lies. I can say the most offensive things imaginable, but then I say, I'm sorry. No, am I showing remorse or am I just covering my back? I think in this particular case, you know, 10 million pounds is at issue. You would have to give it back. And also, of course, the other thing to say is that this particular person has been getting multi-million pound contracts allotted to him by the government for his IT company. So where does remorse sit in that particular kind of, um, in, in that context? So th this is this is where we are now, I think. And it's very not worrying. A, not an easy or a pleasant place to be. Uh, very uneasy. But yet it's something that I think we probably find in all politicians. And so, well, hang on, let me pull back from that in some politicians <laughs> okay um i mean all politicians potentially can do this some don't thank but, you john I, okay. I, i'd like to move on to jessica and and say one way of interpreting what john said at the beginning is what has changed is not the quality of people or their honesty or anything else but technology it's much easier to spread lies now than it was before and uh I wonder how, what your perspective is on that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there's a lot of there, I have a lot of ideas uh, here just based on the, the last two speakers. But, you know, I think what we have forgotten here is that the tools that are in our hands all the time as we walk down the street allow us to generate words and disseminate those words much quicker than we could before. And that, that's the first thing. So the rapidity with which word travels and can be spread um, is, is mind boggling. The second thing though, is this idea of framing that Deborah brought up a little bit. And this idea of, for me, form versus content. Right now we can frame a lie as an alternative fact. And by using the word fact, I mean, this is a really, really clever rhetorical thing that somebody does. Let's just say a politician who we find particularly distasteful. Um, we can say, all right, instead of, you know, so-and-so has their set of facts, but these are my set of alternative facts. The word fact to us, I mean, the word fact to us has a whole bunch of social traction. Fact means real. It means true. To call it alternative facts means that there is an alternative truth or some sort of alternative reality to what we are all living. But it's a really, really clever turn of phrase if you want people to believe you. Um, because somebody could say, well, that's your set of facts, but this is my set of facts. There's still, it's, it's an apples to apples situation. It's not a, a, a lie versus a truth situation. And so that, that's one thing that I think is important to, to, to remember. The second is that we can make things look like facts quite easily. And this is the form versus content duality. Um, you know, we can make something look objective. We can make something look scientific by giving it an almost quantified, and this is the work that I do in, in objectivity, looking at if we can make a fact seem objective by having some statistics, by, which may be manipulated or may be cherry picked. And this is what data generation is doing now for us. It's allow, It's generating numbers that allow certain you know, let's say bad actors to pull out pieces of information out of context and say, well, here's a number. How can you argue with this number? Because, I mean, this is what numbers confer to us. They, they, they confer to us a sense of objectivity untouched by the human hand. And this is, this is, I mean, you know, centuries long research that's been done um, around how numbers can actually be a very important rhetorical tool when you're making an argument and trying to present something as not a lie, as a fact. So I think that technology is one way of thinking about it, but also if we think about the rhetoric of science, science is actually a very persuasive tool to appear as though you're a fact, even though you might be an alternative fact, AKA a lie. That was one of the points I wanted to get to is whether science has been protected from some of this uh, duplicity and and interpretation by individuals. Ian, do you have some thoughts on that? You're muted, Ian. Yeah, sorry. I don't really have any anything to say on on the role of science in this, other than, other than technology. I think um, you know, going back to to where we started with Orwell's um, statement that political language is, is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectful. And I think he's engaging there in something that he's accusing others of doing and, and you know, using hyperbole. The main goal of politicians is to gain and retain power. You know, that, that's what they're about. And they'll use a variety of linguistic practices to do that. Um, some of these are acceptable, so some of these are unacceptable. But I think what what's more unacceptable is is the aims of some politicians. Um, I mean, I think it's perfectly acceptable for a political party to rebrand itself and to to use language that that in a sense rebrands it. You know, using, uh, for example, in the the British Labour Party, the third way, the New Labour. Um, and I think it's it's also great if they if they use linguistic practices to achieve positive social aims. And sometimes that will involve lying. I mean, for example, if um, if the uh, President Zelensky were asked by a, a journalist, where and when are you going to start the 2024 spring offensive? 
he's hardly going to say, right, we're going to start it in the Zaporizhia region around about the end of March. I mean, it'd, it'd be foolish to do that. So in that sense, a lie is perfectly acceptable. I think where where any linguistic advice is unacceptable, and this is where we see a lot of things uh, in the current, is where, where language is used to demonize certain groups, whether those groups are Jews or Muslims or migrants or transgender people or environmentalists or blacks. And, and I think we, we really need to look at the context and the intention of the politician when we're when we're trying to make a decision on whether language is being used acceptably or unacceptably. Mm. There are two particular examples at the moment in the UK and in the United States. Uh, Boris Johnson in, in the UK and Donald Trump in this country who have been openly accused of lying. Uh, that, that really was a turning point in journalism uh, a few years ago while Donald Trump was president in this country to actually say the president of the United States was lying for, for journalistic sources to say that. And uh, uh, Deborah, do you think there's any going back from that? I mean, if you want to brief on this, is there is there any way to establish some new standard of truth or some new way of measuring this so that uh, there are some respectability left, left for certain people, the, the, some of the supporters don't seem to care at all. Yeah, I think that's a great um, question. Yeah, I mean, I also noticed that this, um, actually specifically in this speech, he said 26 things that were not true. Um, and again, is it a lie or is it just, not every untruth uh, is a lie. It is two different things. Um, my inclination is that we have passed a broken a barrier that's not going to go back. Um, and part of the problem is that we've had this person, Donald Trump, who is uttering more untruths than even you know and any other politicians did before. Um, but I think the it's a, for me the most important thing is the stance that certain uses of language um, create uh, and. So much more of our public discourse now is framing the people you disagree with as your enemy. And once people are your enemy, then all kinds of things become acceptable that would not have before. Uh, that was very struck by the um, Don's comment about apologies. Uh, and I'm writing about apologies now, so I'm very interested in that. But in public discourse, it's a way to humiliate your enemy. You demand an apology so that somebody will have to lower themselves, humiliate themselves publicly. Uh, so yeah, there is that aspect of an apology creates shows remorse. Does it really? Does it not? And I think John's absolutely right. Uh, people tend to say anything they want, and then they can apologize uh, and move on, and it's and and then say it again. <laughs> Which about by the way, that too happens in in private life. I'm sick of your apologies. I want you to do something about, about this. Uh, but yeah, it says to me, it all goes down to the um, increasing tendency, and this was happening back in the 90s, the other uh, work that I was doing at that time, um, to frame everything as a fight, and furthermore, to frame people as your enemy. Uh, so uh, specific answer to your question, I suspect we're not going back, that the tendency to accuse others of lying because you don't agree with what they say is probably going to become more common, even though in the case of Trump, they really were untruths. Hmm. And there's a particular, uh, there are many people who say that the media are biased against Trump because they say these things, because they reveal that he has lied about things. And uh, uh, Jessica, I'm interested in your thoughts about this too, that that somehow um, you have to tiptoe, you have to be careful. I know many journalists have felt that, that they have to be cautious since it's widely expected and understood that most journalists are liberals. And at least in this country, that's, that's taken as the case. Now, of course, there are quite a few journalists who are not liberals and who are 
uh, affiliated with Fox News and other other media on the right. But these are old stereotypes that that die hard. And so, it, it, what about the crisis for journalism in all of this? Is there is there uh, going to be a weakening of the journalistic ability to call a lie a lie? Well, I think what we need to start doing um, is instead of, and we, we have to get out of this binary that Deborah talks about, the us versus them, the, the fighting narrative, this very bellicose narrative that we have around politics is actually part of the problem. And a lot of times we forget that in a democracy or even in politics, the roots of those very words, I love etymology, are polis and demos, right? I mean, people. And so when we when we create this sort of binary and we talk even when we talk about things or frame them as the race to the White House, it indicates and I ask this of my students often when we call it the race to the White House, what does that indicate about the voter? It indicates that the voter is just some sort of spectator and not some a sort fan. of fan. A fan, a fan, someone who's cheering people on but has no real um no real dog in the fight you know you can just wave your flag and that's about it and and i i think that when we you know if we think about how we can move out of this it actually involves not pointing fingers um and not saying well fox news is the enemy or you know tr what is it truth social or i mean there are people that vote based on that being their sole news source. And the more kind of discussions that we can have and the more people we can interpolate into these discussions, the, the better off we will be as a true democracy. There's a lot of hand-wringing right now among liberals because they think that this is, you know, there's there's a, a rightness. I'm not saying that the right or the left is is correct in any of this everybody is busy pointing fingers and nobody is thinking well let's cross the line and invite others into the conversation and this is why we often see in in the headlines as though it's so amazing so and so you know across the aisle and then collaborated with this um you know here we have the the well, we have a three-party system here but um, you you know you see this like labor worked with the Tories or the Republicans worked with the Democrats as though it's this amazing thing that could that is is so incredulous. Why? Two people agreed on something and had a conversation and came to some sort of resolution for a problem. And when we start focus on focusing on problem solving as opposed to fighting, I think that we can actually move out of this. It's gonna it listen. I might not be in my lifetime, but I think it's gonna be much more productive politically for everybody involved mm. oh, you know John. it's interesting it's interesting that this isn't this isn't a new problem in a sense if we go back yeah. to you know to some of Thucydides who who was describing the debate uh, in mm. Athens uh, when they were under attack from the Spartans what strategy should they adopt and Thucydides identified two orators who used very different rhetorical practices he identified Pericles on one hand, who used um, instructive rhetoric, where he was focusing on on gnosi, focusing on knowledge, and um, giving the demos the the knowledge that they needed to make a an informed decision. And he contrasted Pericles' approach with the approach of Cleon, who focused on orgy, on anger, on whipping up um, support for a political. Point. And we see exactly those um, those those um, those modes of rhetoric in current debate. So we get we get some um, some orators, some politicians who use demagogic practices, who try to whip up anger, particularly against the 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 um, those who are less able to defend themselves in the country. And we we see other politicians. A very good example in the UK is Rory Stewart. I don't know if you ever watch his. Um, his um his uh, podcast um but he he tries to use um instructive rhetoric he tries to explain um the reasoning behind his decisions and what he did and i think if we can 
of course, of course, emotion is always going to be part of political discourse. Uh, you know, Cicero himself, in his uh, writings on on rhetoric, said, said that the the role of the politician is to engage with the emotions. But he also insisted that for someone to be a good orator, a good political um, rhetorician, then he should be a good person. And I think that's one of the problems that we have currently, that too many politicians um, lack the character. And that comes over in, in the way that they, that, they, um, that they debate things. In one sense, you could say that people like Trump and Johnson were authentic. They are liars, they are dishonest, and their rhetoric reflects that. But we don't want that kind of authentic rhetoric. We want the kind of authentic rhetoric that comes from people who have the interests of the demos at their heart. Mm. John, thank you, Ian. That's very uh, revealing, I think, of ancient times and where some of this comes from. But John, isn't isn't there an ideal of the articulate politician, an ideal of the person who stands before the the, the the public and inspires them. I mean, if everyone spoke in a dull manner, uh, we might say they're more noble, but they wouldn't rally people. They wouldn't get people to listen to them. Um, well, the short answer to that is yes. Um, but also, I think, in the case of people like Johnson, I'm talking about um, Boris Johnson now, um, it's got a lot to do with the kind of education that you've got. Um, I don't know whether this travels well across the pond or not, but um, I mean, Johnson is the product of public school Oxbridge. You're taught a certain way of life there. Um, and uh, of course, people in Oxford would deny this. I'm sure people um, in Eton would, would deny it. And by public didn't... school, you mean private school in this case? Yes, I beg your pardon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Two, two cultures separated by a language. Um, right. Yeah, uh, yes, I, pri private education. I mean, we have we have two. Uh, I'm sure you all know this. Right. Anyway. But um, but what, what I wanted to get back to, I, I didn't want to lose it, was just something that, um, that Jessica said about alternative facts. Um, now, there was a time when there was such a thing as truth and falsehood, right? And the problem was always trying to find out whether the truth was the truth or whether it was a falsehood. Um, and this goes back historically. But we are now in a different kind of situation because the truth, it depends upon where you come from, depends upon the position that you adopt. So there are alternative truths and that kind of pluralization of the truth is where we are now. So that uh, it's very easy for somebody like Boris Johnson or um, Donald Trump to appeal to alternative facts. Now, I don't know because I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I doubt very much whether the election that uh, lost Donald Trump, the White House, um, was stolen. There must be statistics here that make it very clear that one side won and the other side lost. And simply by saying, well, no, 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 it's been it's been stolen, and then inventing a whole series of uh, reasons as to why it should have been stolen. This at some point should be verifiable, and it should be verifiable statistically. So we now sort of key into this idea of the pluralization uh, of truth. And this has got a philosophical basis as well. You know, Heidegger, Nietzsche, we can go back. Um, and I mean, even on the left here, Marx, you know, when what you do is you look at a particular problem and then you decide where the um, upholder of a particular position is, and you can then challenge it. I mean, there is a sense, I think, where we are all, as academics, involved in the process of argumentation. 
I mean, when I first went into university as an undergraduate, lecturers talked to me about argument. I mean, I came from the back streets of Cardiff where an argument was, if someone disagreed with you, you thumped them or they thumped you. You know, <laughs> that was argument. Talking to people wasn't an argument. You know, it was putting a point of view. And I think that uh, there's a sense in which, you know, th that kind of rhetoric has now come into every aspect of, of our lives. But philosophically, there is a basis here for uh, making the claim that truth is not uniform any longer. It's in fact plural. So that there is, there is not one truth. There are truths. And it depends upon where you come from. You know, what position you adopt. I mean, I don't know if... What if, about, yeah, what so, about the relativity of truth? I mean... It, 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 well, it's... The it, standard way of telling for is something is more true than something else. More nearly true. Well, yeah, of course, what we what we do usually, I mean, on, on an everyday, um, we think about truth empirically. You know, you look around for evidence of what seems to you to be true. You know, um, I mean, for example, human beings walk with their feet. They don't walk on their heads. And, you know, we can look around, we can get the evidence and we can draw a conclusion. Now, there are other kinds of situations where it's not quite so easy. And politics is just one of those situations where, you know, it's very difficult for even in a, a parliamentary democracy like ours. But I mean, there's a sense in which I suppose in the States, you've got a version of a parliamentary democracy um, where, you know, people vote, uh, they send representatives to uh, an organization and they debate uh, laws and things of that kind, uh, and they control life. I mean, that's what we do. I mean, I vote every four or five years. Um, I don't think I have any kind of influence. Uh, I don't think I lobby people particularly. Um, but of course, if I if I were a multimillionaire, then it would be in my interest to go and lobby. In other words, to try to persuade a politician to my point of view. Um, and the more people you can persuade to your point of view in that situation, um, the better off you will be. And this is the case of this man, Frank Hester, who's lobbied politicians, given political a political party money, and in return is given lots of contracts. And he's not the only one. I mean, he's just the latest in Britain in a, in a, in a long line. Um, right. Of businessmen. Well, I mean, before, I, I, yeah, I was, I was back, we'll go back to Mike Scott and and see what uh, questions have come out with the last. I'm going to just sort of a lightning round, right? And uh, I'll pose this question, but if there are other things to say briefly, but, I'd, I'd like to hear them. Could um, I jump in with one thing before we? Sure, continue? Deborah, go ahead. Yeah. I just want to kind of pull together some of the points that everybody just made that are, sure, I think, related in a complex way. Um, so Ian pointed out we need later leaders who are more, you know, better people and and um, have uh, people's good in mind. The fact that we don't is in part a response to the kind of thing we're talking about because the public. Um, and journalists have a lot of uh, responsibility here. Um, they pick up scandals because it gets readers, uh, and people accuse other people, other people of um, evil doings when they haven't, just because they want to make a point. Or um, so Norm Ormstein has written about this uh, in the past. People who entered public life, yeah, you had to make a sacrifice financially but you gained a kind of respect. At this point in our lives, someone who enters public life is likely to have their rep rep reputation destroyed uh, and their lives, their families are gonna be um, thrown into chaos because there's gonna be you know, journalists outside their house demanding. Right. So, uh, so I think these, all these things are related. Uh, and the, uh, Jessica made the point that we're uh, approaching things as a horse race, yeah, that's because it's easier to follow. Jim Fellows, has, journalist, has pointed this out, that journalists aren't really covering 
the business of running government, they're they're much more comfortable covering elections as a horse race. Yes. So I, I just want to point out how all those things are related. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to try and do a quick lightning round before we go back to Mike and, and this question. What is the future of politics in our countries and what is your advice? I want to start with Jessica, who is teaching day by day and, and having an opportunity to influence people. What would your advice be to young people, Jessica, who want to go into this line of work that we have thoroughly trashed? Uh, I think that I would want them to approach the polis, right, the public, as not a monolith. And if I think about, and listen, I have teenage kids and I teach just out of teenagehood, 20, you know, 20 to 30 year olds. They live bespoke lives. And if we forget, I think it is at our peril, certainly in these discussions to forget that everything is curated to the individual now, whether it is your news uh, whether it is your Facebook feed or your Instagram feed, we think about exactly who you are because there are algorithms behind, you know, um, behind the screen that identify your preferences, your likes, your dislikes. They do very, very complex and nuanced work at a at a linguistic level. I mean, these large language models are are doing that. They're figuring out exactly what's going to appeal to you because the competition for eyeballs is fierce or the competition for you know ears what have you the competition for your attention and this has been written about widely um yes. but tim Wu writes about the attention merchants right we're just selling people's attention right now uh in in any sort of media that's that's the job i mean this was thought about as the commodity audience many moons ago when we had broad we were still talking about broadcast television which barely exists now but the public is no longer a monolith. Students, my kids, don't see themselves as part of some sort of collective. They see themselves as an individual and, and because everything is curated for them. And not thinking about the ways in which we've got all of these tools at our disposal, politicians have all these tools at their disposal, to target markets, to use economic terms, but to target the, these markets so that everything that comes out of their mouth or every slogan that gets sort of marketed to them is unique and it seems as though it's speaking directly to them. Thank you. Um, so in other words, there's a, a loss of the collective interest in the, overall. Uh, we have to do these quickly so we can get back to Mike. Uh, Ian, what, what, what would you say about this? What would you tell young people interested in politics to change? Well, I would, I would say go for it. I mean, I I have been an active politician. I was a I was a city councillor in in Dundee, which is the the fourth largest city in Scotland, and I met a lot of good people there, people who were authentically good and authentically honest in their in their political discourse. I I think when you know when we look at the national picture, the picture coming from from the press, we get a very distorted view of what real politics is like. Real politics is much more about working together and. Um, and getting things done for the good of the, the people. And I think if, if young people go into politics with that aim, they'll do well and if, if they if they reflect that authentically in their uh, in what they say publicly. John? Well, I've never advised my students what to do. Um, I educate them and they then make up their own minds what they want to do. Um, but I have a much deeper concern, really, um, and it's to do with the philosophy of individualism. There's a big difference, I think, with British culture, between British culture and American culture. American culture, as far as I can see, and I'm looking at it now from a distance of three and a half thousand miles, right, is a culture of the individual, right? It commercializes appeals to the individual. We in the UK still have um, a philosophy of what you might call socialism, right? That is to say, people work together. You know, they, they, they work as a collective. 
it's true much more up in Scotland, I think, Ian, uh, you might bear this out, much more true up in Scotland mm. than it is in England. England, particularly southern England, is moving towards the American system. And it's interesting if you see politics like that in the UK as a conflict between the kind of individualism where America is uh, and the kind of collective, um, which, of course, the name is socialism. And by socialism, of course, I don't mean the kind of things that went on in Russia or anything like that, you know. Um, yes. I mean, it seems to me one, one has to be very careful how one defines right. these, Thank you. these terms. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, just real quickly before we go back to Mike, is there anything you would you try to impart to young people about how to get into this work? Yeah, I, I would say that it certainly, as John said, I don't tell them what to do. I try to give them information. But um, for me, it's it's because I teach linguistics, it's sensitivity to language and sensitivity to the ways different people from different cultures use language. And I tried, to, it's almost like a peace march. Um, you know, when I was young, I was on peace marches. This is my current peace march. Um, to stop for a moment before you think someone is doing something evil and has evil intentions or is a stupid person and just step back and ask what could what could the world look like from their point of view and could could it be just a different use of language from their cultural background so i guess thank I guess you that's fine. thank yeah. you back to you mike thanks very much very interesting and um uh a rather long question has come in from uh, Travis Thornton, which I'll read to you and uh, and then and can see who he see who wants to take it first. One uh, Travis says one of the most pressing issues we face is the regulation of misinformation online, our news consumption shapes our views, and roughly half of all news consumed occurs within online social media. Mm. Misinformation travels faster and farther than the truth with implications for our democracy and national security. Authors of quantitative analysis catalogued rumor cascades of both true and false news online in terms of the depth, breadth, and structural virility to analyze the diffusion dynamics of 126,000 rumors spread by 3 million people on Twitter between 2006 and 2017, and found false news spreading significantly far farther and faster than the truth, concluding it took the truth about six times as long as falsehood to reach 1,500 people. Given this, given this, he says, how can governments effectively regulate misinformation without infringing on the freedom of speech? <laughs> Deborah, mm -hmm. um, was it Orwell who said a lie travels ha halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes? I guess that's um, even more so now. Uh, I guess my answer is they can't. And I think you put your finger on uh, how much more extreme all these processes are because of the internet and social media. Um, and if the government, whoever that is, could um, affect it and control it, they would probably, at least, mm, at least some of the parties that are in, in power now would want to control it just to get their own side, uh, give them a, la a larger, louder megaphone. So I guess this isn't a solution, but I think it's putting your finger on something very, very scary and very true. I'll come to you, Jessica. I just wonder if after that, what you've just said, Deborah that in China, they have tried to control it right from the start. And of course, in Russia, it is being controlled uh, vigorously. Um, you might just want to take that into consideration. I'll come to 
uh, come to uh, the rest. Jessica. Yeah, I think what we need to do is actually think about who we say, how can governments, the assumption there is that the, the government that is in power is one that is is favorable Correct. and good. Correct. I mean, if you've got a government in power, as you know, we saw in Canada anyway, we watched the, it unfold south of the border, the the flaming dumpster fire of, of the evisceration of so many human rights. You know, if if you've got a government in power that doesn't see anything wrong with misinformation and in fact it encourages it, then really the regulation is actually being done by people you don't want to be doing the regulating. What I do want to, to come back to, though, is this idea of, and China is a really interesting example, because if we think about the circulation of, of misinformation, we can maybe start figuring out, we, I mean, um, how to allow for channels of information to circulate. And I think that, you know, China has done some really, really interesting things. I know that I think it was Xi Jinping who wanted to cut or or, or really quell conversations of the GDP. Um, but if you actually look at the phonemes of GDP in Chinese, um, G means chicken, and DP is a, like chicken farts. So these conversations were were brewing around farting chickens. So it was actually the population talking about the GDP without alerting the government that they were talking about the GDP because they just would they couched it in in chicken flatulence. So people are creative. The public is creative. They will figure out what is information to them. And again, sometimes we don't want to acknowledge that, but it is. And what's misinformation to them? Thanks for that. I find that very amusing. Ian. Ever scatological I am, you know. <laughs> yeah, Ian, please. Yeah, I mean, I I think social media has positive as well as, as, well as negative things in it. Um, I was watching a podcast the other day and they, they referred to... Um, the statement made by uh, Radek Sikorsky, an Oxford man, incidentally, who um, who is foreign minister of Poland. And he was responding to um, a speech made at the United Nations by the Russian uh, representative. And he went through it line by line, pointing out um, the, the, um, the, that each line was, in fact, incorrect. And I think I think each of us has a responsibility there. When we see something on um, on social media um, and, and, and we can fact check it, then we have a responsibility at least to let our followers or those, our friends, know that, that, that that's not true. I, I was very interested in, um, in Twitter, when it was Twitter, that it banned Donald Trump. But then, of course, along comes uh, free speecher Elon Musk and, um, and, and does away with that. So I think that um, that platforms have some responsibility as well as the government. I think Twitter exercised that responsibility um, appropriately from my perspective, uh, and I think Elon Musk is 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 exercising that inappropriately by by allowing um, someone who who not just pr promotes falsehood, but as you'll probably get the message. My big thing is when those falsehoods are directed at demonising particular groups within society. That's where I feel things are badly wrong. And and, and that kind of demonization uh, should certainly be controlled, if not by the platforms themselves, but, then by government. But as I say, I think we all have a responsibility there as well. John. Mm. I mean, I, I agree with, with much of what's been said. Um, I still have a problem, though, because I think that the social media that we have may well be a symptom rather than a cause. I mean, it's now become so ubiquitous that it looks like a cause of something. I think it's really a symptom of um, the way in which we've shifted from thinking about basic things like truth, um, basic things like democracy. I mean, does democracy mean that you can do what you like and you can say what you like? I don't think so, at least historically. Um, it isn't. But, um, you know, freedom of speech. I'm not sure what that phrase means, because there are certain things that you can't say. You know, I mean, if I would, 
Well, no, I'm not going to give you any examples because for the very simple reason that they can easily be excerpted and I could be locked up. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, we all police ourselves in many respects, and that's a cultural phenomenon. Um, it's very, very different, I think, from the States. I remember I once went uh, to, to, to the States and I was involved in a conversation. And for some reason, I can't remember what the conversation was now, but I used the phrase that so-and-so calls a spade a spade, right? Um, there was that kind of uncomfortable silence um, when you realise that you said something that you shouldn't have, but you don't know what it is. And I was quietly taken aside by somebody. And, you know, when I use the word spade, I mean an implement that you shovel earth with. Um, and in the UK, that used to be, uh, you know, a, 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 a kind of way of saying, you know, this, this person is down to earth, uh, no frills and all the rest of it. And of course, it doesn't mean that um, in um, cosmopolitan New York um, or anywhere else uh, in, in the States, I would think. And we constantly do that. I, I remember another occasion uh, when I was involved in a discussion uh, to do with the philosophy of, um, uh, of Jacques Derrida. It was in Brazil. And a friend of mine was sitting next to me, uh, very anti-deconstruction, uh, said to the speaker, uh, who he'd addressed a question, and the speaker did a very kind of Derridian uh, turn to get around it. He said, ah, he said, I see what you are doing. You are performing a bayanada, right? He thought a bayanada meant a detour. In fact, a bayanada refers to a, a kind of, um, you know, a, a sort of hick from Bahia. And this person, I don't know, the person on the other side of me, who was the vice chancellor of the university we were at, said, does he know what he's just said? And I said, no. And we have to be very, very careful here that when we use language, that it can be inflected, contextualized differently. I mean, your point about GDP and chickens, um, I mean, that's really a very interesting one. Uh, because it, it it partakes of the same thing. So, I mean, language is malleable like that. And, and I, uh, I think what you're saying, John, again, it's an effect of what we're talking about. Uh, yeah. the, and what Ian just said about demonizing each other. We're all scared to open our mouths because we realize someone out there might be looking to demonize us or someone and we'll be the person of the moment. Um and well, I, don't know. I mean, I mean it's a long time ago, but it's so much worse now. I, th I think academics are getting progressively more and more thin skinned. I come from the thick skinned generation where you said it and, uh, you know, then you ducked. Um, but uh, but yes, I, I think that I think that's right. Um, but again, it's it's problematical insofar as it doesn't allow us to take the argument further. Or it doesn't allow us to, you know, to take the discussion further because there comes a point when, you know, you we have to declare our credentials, and, and that's I, something. I say the implications are really serious. Um, some years ago, I was talking to a public figure in a major position that in the past he would give a press conference and pretty much talk freely about what he had to communicate, and he said now he would not do that. He has prepared yeah. statements because that risk that you're going to just say something. And because of the recording uh, ability, of course, now that's a big part of it too. You can say what, take what someone said in one context, take a bit of it and make it look much worse than it was in reality. I mean, we sound like we, we want to get back to the old idea where the truth was the truth. And, uh, you know, when someone said something, you believed it no matter what. Unfortunately, there's too much at stake here. Um, you know, I mean, th those who mob, sort of manipulate the truth have something to gain. You know, I mean, I, I don't know if this is true, but is it my under is my understanding correct that the reason why Donald Trump wants to get back into power is that it means that he cannot be prosecuted 
for the crimes which, uh, at the moment, um, he's being arraigned for. Is that right? Or is this a is 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 this a kind of British take on Donald Trump? I think the assumption is that Donald Trump will pardon himself for everything. Once well, exactly, ex exactly. But also um, that he would have wanted to get back in power no matter what. <laughs> well, can, can we move to, uh, to just take this on to uh, one of our questioners, uh, uh, Menten Lu, uh, who says, how do you determine certain use of language as lies? Does manipulation of imagination or deliberately leave out part of the truth a lie? Is the manipulation of imagination or to deliberately leave out part of the truth a lie? I mean, I think it's following on from, from what you're saying. But Jessica, would you like to take that? Well, but I think, you know, I, I actually, I love this question. Um, and it really does speak to the individuality of language and our own interpretation and this idea. I think that the, that a word does not mean the same to you as it does to me. And what we're, what we're I, I think missing here is the sort of individual experience of certain words. I do this experiment with my kid, with my kids and my students. If I say the word dog to you, which is ostensibly a four-legged creature that barks, and I say, imagine a dog in your head, nobody is going to have the same dog in there. And, and dog is an easy word because it actually, it's, there's, a, there's an external referent that's pretty, I mean, agreed upon. Um, but what if we talked about something like freedom? That is <laughs> is open to so many interpretations um, or or even truth. And, and I think that this is kind of, you know, it's, it's going to be an impossible, there's no litmus test for determining language as a lie or language as the truth. And, and I, I take, I take issue, John, even though we've never met um, with this idea of these halcyon days of the truth many years ago, the truth was this like when men were men and women were women. It, and, you know, it's just because we can digitally regurgitate things now really quickly doesn't necessarily mean that before we had this ability to, to sort of digitally spread stuff in, you know, a hot second, that things were more truthful back then. No, I don't not, think so at all. That's that's not what I said, Deborah. Um, the thing is, there is a philosophical basis for this, right? That there is something called truth and that there may be various different ways of distorting, expanding, extending it, right? That's one thing. There's a whole philosophy, and it's a it's a Christian philosophy, I think, that lies behind it, right? There is now a very different situation where uh, you know if you if you think about the postmodern world, postmodernity, the fragmentation of reality, then that's where alternative facts come in, and that's where truth, in that all philosophical sense. Is now under well, it's it's now gone. Um, you know, I mean, we live in. But was, uh, but was it ever there? Is my question because I would say no. Uh, I'm afraid it was. You know, uh, the thing is, you I, can, I I think you, I you, think you're you going to find point. a lot of people who would argue with that point. Well, you can. You, I mean, I think the body of evidence is there to suggest that it was. I mean. It didn't mean to say that people didn't lie. It didn't mean to say that people had different um, uh, sort of approaches. What, what on, body of evidence? The body of evidence of people who maybe could write oh. things down and were literate? I mean, that, uh, that's well, actually, I mean, well, that's a bit um, spurious, spurious. Well, no, <laughs> not quite, not quite. Um, I think if you're if you're thinking of, of, of a non-literate society, which is what you're saying, people who couldn't write things down, they didn't. 450 years ago, the vast majority of people were non-literate. Now, what we have to do is to argue what that means, right? It doesn't mean that you were at a disadvantage. It meant that you had different attitudes towards uh, daily life, memory, um, you know, individuality, problematical term in the 16th century. Not now. Um, I'm going to bring in Ian Finley here because I... I've seen him twitching away there. Yeah, Ian. I mean, I just want to challenge to some. I mean, I I, I hear what what uh, what Jessica's saying about about different people having having different 
views of the world. But if you ask someone to imagine a dog, or if you ask a group of people to imagine a dog, there's certainly a family of images that they would have exactly. that would represent dogs. Not many of them would imagine a cow or a cat. So the, 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 there's a clear distinction between what's a cow and what's a cat. I'm sorry, what's a dog? And similarly with freedom, I mean, I think there are many perspectives on freedom, but I think if, if people were in prison, um, they would certainly feel that in certain dimensions they didn't have freedom. They may imagine that they had, they, they still had freedom of will, freedom of their mind, but they would, they would know that they weren't able to. So although the, although that the, there are different perspectives that different individuals hold, there are still things that are identifiable as in, in family groups. Now I think one of the problems that we have in current politics is that people are saying. This is a this is a cow and pointing to a dog, <laughs> or this is freedom and pointing to imprisonment. I think that's the problem we have. It's it's it, it, it's not the fact that people have have different um, legitimate perspectives. I think they have now they have different illegitimate perspectives. Mm -hmm. Jean Paul Sartre once said that he never felt so free as when he was under German occupation. So. Mm. Well, that's a kind of freedom. He, he perhaps felt freedom what? of mind or freedom of expression. To but my it's, point, it's, it, it's not it's not the wider freedom that most of us would um, would would imagine. I I suspect very individual the way we interpret the word the concept of freedom, even the way we we understand the word dog. It's an insult. She was ugly as a dog. Mm -hmm. It is an insult, yes, in that context, but it's not a cat mm. <laughs> or a pussy. Oh, well. Can I uh, uh, go back to uh, 1625 and Francis Bacon, who said, subjective truth is not confined by science. Uh, it depends uh, on, our, on one's own opinion and beliefs. And it may be true or false. Objective mm -hmm. truth is confined by science and is universally accepted. Mm -hmm. And not that... just science is so objective. <laughs> There's quite a bit written now about how science itself is um, pretty subjective and what seemed true in one era or study turns out not to be. So all this- Because different. science changes, but it was true well, for I... them. Yeah, true but it, them. it gets, it gets I mean, with science, it gets with this is Thomas Kuhn's, isn't it? The structure of scientific revolutions. What happens is that uh, empirical science, as it evolves, lights on certain truths. Then objections build up against it, and finally, the old ideas topple, and a new one takes its place. Um, I mean, absolute truth, I think, is 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 probably a a very difficult term to do, to, to 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 define. In this context, yeah. Isn't it? Okay, I'm going to have to start to bring it to a close now. But uh, thank you very much. But uh, being a Shakespearean, I, I must end with with a favourite line I have from Shakespeare. It comes in Antony and Cleopatra at the end when uh, Antony has died and uh, Octavius comes on and he makes all these kind of promises to Cleopatra um, about what's going to happen to her and she needn't be frightened and all the rest of it. And as he goes off, she turns uh, to her attendants and she says, he words me, girls. He words me. <laughs> Word. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, I'm going to ask Sandy, have you got anything uh, to say now, Sandy, In uh, before I close? You'd muted, Sandy. Sorry, Mike, I thought That's I just it. unmuted myself. Um, I do want to thank Deborah, Ian, John, and Jessica for their very articulate contributions to this conversation. It went in some directions I think we, we hadn't quite imagined, but to our benefit. And uh, thank you all for your participation. Thanks, Mike. I, I want to thank you for a change and say what a pleasure it is to work with you. We've been doing this for 40, 
42 straight months now. And uh, we're going to keep going. And thank John McCabe, who works with me in, at Georgetown and, and helps us get actually get these things pulled together and on the air. And uh, does it with a unique calm about him, as our panelists will have noticed. And thanks to Georgetown University and the people at Oxford, Mike, who work with you for their support for our series. And uh, we're very grateful to those who listen in to it. Yes, can I? Yeah, thank you as well, Sandy, and th and thank the uh, the four of you for a really enjoyable uh, discussion. Uh, the next free speech project of the Crossroads International Dialogues, events in association with the Future Humanities Project, will be on Wednesday, um, April the seventeenth at uh, four p.m. UK time, which is eleven a.m. Uh, uh, US time. The clocks will be. Um, uh, synchronized once again then um, and we'll be discussing uh, whether you can separate the art from the artist the idea that uh, Hitler might have done a painting do you shred it or do you keep it so and uh, I know we've got some uh, some good artists lined up to uh, to to discuss that. It'd be interesting. We're moving from speech into visual art, um, and and away perhaps from politics a little bit. Um, so that's on seventeenth of April. I I also want to mention that uh, we have another Zoom in the um, uh, cultural encounters series on uh, Monday the fifteenth of April when uh, Colin Parsons from Georgetown. Uh, we'll be discussing that in an in, in enormous experimental uh, book, Seven Years to Write, um, uh, which is Ulysses. Um, so that, that's going to be really interesting. How he's, how he's going to discuss that within a, within a short space of time. But we're looking forward to that. That's within the, the Cultural Encounters series, Monday the 15th of April, uh, 11 a.m. EST, 4 p.m. GMT. My thanks to the colleagues at uh, Georgetown, particularly President Jack DeJoy and Vice President Global Affairs Tom Banchoff for, for their help. Um, my, my thanks to, to John to John McCabe. My thanks uh, to Campion Hall, to Nick Austin, the master. Uh, my thanks at Blackfriars to John O'Connor, the regent, and uh, Richard Finn, the director of the Las Casas Institute. Thank you for uh, asking questions today. Um, uh, there were terrific questions. We didn't have many, but there were terrific questions that got the panel really going. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for attending. I'm Professor Mike Scott. I'm Fellow and Senior Dean at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. You can follow me on Facebook as Michael Kerr Scott or on LinkedIn as Professor Michael Scott. You can't follow me on X anymore. I don't know why, but I don't use it. Until next time, take care and keep safe. And thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.